Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. And um, today I thought we'd do something a little bit different, and dare I say, fun. A couple of weeks ago, we made a video about the breakup of the Titanic, and the Titanic Honor and Glory guys were good enough to let me use their brilliant plans of the ship to demonstrate what was going on inside. And while I was looking around the plans, I was fascinated at all the incredible details that they've included. So I thought today we'd talk about the plans in a little bit more detail and have a bit of a look through them. Plans of Titanic are kind of few and far between. It turns out that because Titanic was extremely similar to her sister ship Olympic, uh, there are a lot of plans of Olympic out there and some really nice degree of detail, but unfortunately a lot of plans of Titanic have since been lost. For builders, it was good to keep plans around while your ship was in service, because they needed to know how to fix the ship if she ran into any trouble. Even in cases of emergency, they, they came in handy. So holding onto the plans wasn't uncommon for a ship with a long career. If a ship sank, the builders typically didn't hold on to plans that long. They weren't really sentimental about it. So often they were just thrown out or destroyed. We don't know for certain what happened to the majority of Titanic's plans, but during the Belfast Blitz in the Second World War, the German Air Force really knocked the hell out of Belfast and uh, Harland and Wolf bore the brunt of that assault because they were the main industrial part of that city. And a lot of their plans were lost. Their archives, a lot of it was burned. And it's possible that a lot of Titanic's plans were lost then. So recreating the Titanic in plan form is no easy task, which is very impressive when you consider that the Titanic Honor and Glory team, especially Matthew de Winclair, have worked extremely hard to create this stunning set of plans that I see before me. Now these plans are available on the Titanic Honor and Glory website, and I'll include a link in the description below. But I thought what we could do is just have a little look around and look at some of the interesting things that kind of stand out. Cool, so we'll start off on the boat deck, which is the uppermost exposed deck of the ship, around about here. The bridge is surprising to some people because it isn't one open space. There's actually a couple of unique little things going on here. Most importantly of all is the fact that the ship's main steering wheel, the helm, is enclosed in a, a wheelhouse. And this was to protect the ship's main wheel from any damage. Ships the size of Titanic could still cop a big wave over the nose. And in fact, uh, Lusitania in 1910, took a rogue wave that was about 70 feet tall, right over her nose, and it bashed her bridge in, and uh, it was forever changed. It, was, it sent it back, smashed all the windows, almost washed the crew who were in the bridge at the time out. Pretty dramatic stuff. So you want to protect that wheel. Titanic did have a emergency backup steering position at the back of the ship, towards the stern on the uh, docking bridge, but you want to have your main wheel protected. So it was in this little space, and interestingly, at night time, the ship would be sailing along and the helmsman who'd be standing at this little platform here where the main wheel is would have that room enclosed and all the windows shut. They had little wooden shutters and all those shutters would be down. The reason the windows in the wheelhouse had shutters was because at night time, the bridge had to be in total blackness so that the officers and crew would be able to see in the dark and preserve their night vision ahead. But the wheelhouse needed light so that the helmsman could get a better idea of what he was doing. So the wheelhouse would have the lights on, he could see what he was doing, and then the light wouldn't be escaping out into the, into the main bridge. The navigating bridge itself sits forward of this, and it's an interesting space because it's got a bunch of different telegraphs. So at either side outboard of the navigating bridge, you've got the engine room telegraph, so the port and starboard engines. So this is what you would do to command each engine independently. And actually, you could order one engine to go full ahead, the other engine to go astern, and that would actually turn the ship without the rudder's use. One of the interesting telegraphs is the docking telegraph. So this could be used to signal the men who are way back at the stern of the ship how to actually maneuver the ship around when it was in port. If they wanted to cast off the lines, if they wanted to reattach them, if they wanted to slacken the lines, let the ship out a little bit, tighten the lines up if it was drifting too far they'd be able to telegraph it all the way back because on the docking bridge at the very stern of the ship, which is that platform right on the, the, the back of Titanic, there was a corresponding telegraph. It would send the order through and then the officer who was uh, in charge at that point would be able to tell the crew at the stern 800 feet away what to do. A lot of ships at the time had a docking telegraph at the bow of the ship as well because in Titanic's case, that was like 200 feet, maybe 150, 200 feet in front of them. So you're not going to be shouting it out with a loudspeaker. There'd be a telegraph there, but Titanic didn't have one. Instead, Titanic had portable deck telephones that could be installed at the very front of the ship so that the officer who was in charge of letting go the lines there would be able to sit with his 
uh, handpiece to his ear and listen out for any orders and then communicate that they'd been received and all was well. And then that telephone, which stood on a brass pedestal, could be unplugged. There was literally a socket. It could be unplugged, shipped, and then Titanic could, could go off. I forget exactly where I read it, but it was um, somebody's memoirs. I think it might have been James Bissett, the Cunard Commodore, who said that the, uh, the connection on those old telephones was really bad and you had to almost speak another language in order to actually understand <laughs> what anybody was saying. There's a lot of detail in the bridge, but we have to move on. Now, another one of those really interesting spaces that you don't really hear a lot about is right here, the elevator gear room. This contained three very powerful and extremely impressive electric winches and motors, essentially, that were designed to lift Titanic's elevators up and down. An elevator operating in a shaft like that can create a vacuum, kind of like a plunger, uh, moving up and down. So Titanic needed a special kind of uh, vent in this room to allow air to enter and exit the elevator shaft as that elevator was going up and down. You can see it in a photograph that I'll put up now. Special kind of little mushroom headed vent, kind of cool. One thing I really like about these plans is for the first time that I know of, you get a very clear layout of all of the different gym machinery. A lot of this stuff was uh, pretty bizarre. <laughs> um, from left to right, I guess, we've got two riding machines, otherwise known as the electric camel. This was to simulate riding a horse or a camel. There was a pulley weight machine. Look, that's really similar to what you would expect to find in a gym today, which is quite impressive. There were cycles, so you could actually race the person next to you. There was a little needle that would go around and you could actually figure out who was doing the faster lap. There's a massage table. All of that seems pretty fine. But on, on the other side, things get a little bit unusual because here we have a weighing chair. And although that doesn't sound particularly weird, at the time it was extremely common before exercise to weigh yourself and then to weigh yourself after exercise. It was thought that you could see some immediate kind of weight loss or results. To the left of that, there's a, uh, a vibration machine, a trunk rotating machine, and a back rubbing machine. So essentially you would just sit there and the machine would just kind of move you around a bit and rub you and do all that. And this is very reminiscent of those really bad infomercials that you see at about 2 a.m where the machine does all the work for you and by moving you around you lose weight. We know it's not true and it's just really interesting that this is kind of like the dawn of this age of them trying to figure out fitness and, and personal health and well-being and uh, yeah they were kind of experimenting with some stuff. It's really cool to actually see what all of these things actually were. This is really cool here. This is back below uh, number three funnel because these are some pretty overlooked spaces as well. You've got the big tank room, which sat over the engine room's uh, casing. That was the big skylight that let all the light and air down into the engine room. But then on the starboard side, there's actually an engineer's smoking room. So the engineers were held in extremely high regard on board ships like this. You've got to remember, this is really early on, relatively speaking, in the, the steamship era. And before then, for hundreds of years, sailors had to know how to whole lines, set sail, trim sail. It was really organic kind of melding of machine and nature. But then all of a sudden these smoke spewing monstrosities like the, uh, the Titanic appeared. And so suddenly sailors needed to know things like electronics and machinery and engineering. And so the engineer was like this new age of, of sailor. By 1912 and Titanic's day, they were very well established. But it's interesting here that the engineers were given their own little promenade. This whole area here was dedicated to engineers so they could stretch their legs. And they got a little um, smoking room here, which was quite cool. They actually had access uh, with ladders all the way down into the belly of the Titanic through the engine room casing. There was actually just a series of ladders so they could very easily um, walk out here, go into the tank room, and then walk through this, uh, this doorway here down into the, uh, into the bottom of the ship. Speaking of Titanic's officers and uh, ships getting hit with giant waves, just behind the number one funnel, there's a really interesting locker here. It says oil skins. And these were the really heavy duty thick coats that officers and ship's crew would wear in wet weather. They were oiled and essentially they were uh, really heavy wet weather gear. And if you had your oil skins on, you were going to be in for a very interesting time. I don't know that they were used very much and certainly on Titanic, they weren't used at all. Down one deck, on a deck, things get really interesting because this is where you start to see passenger cabins and staterooms and things like that. 
this is all very similar to Olympic. All the nice rooms are here, the first class lounge, the reading and writing room. These are all really well documented. They're beautifully represented in Titanic Honor and Glory. I think my favorite staterooms on the ship have got to be these ones at the Grand Staircase, A36 and A37. They were inhabited by two of the more famous passengers on Titanic. One of those was uh, Father Frank Brown. He was a priest who was traveling in the early part of Titanic's voyage, and he actually got off at uh, Queenstown or Cove in Ireland, and he took a number of photographs of Titanic on board, including one actually taken in his stateroom, which is quite cool. The other stateroom was actually Thomas Andrews' stateroom, the designer of the ship, and I actually can't imagine a cooler cabin than to be right there, right at the Grand Staircase, where you could just walk out, walk into the smoking room, go down to the dining saloon, you're right there. It's very cool, you're right in the heart of it, you know? Here is the turbine casing. So this is the, um, the, the shaft that essentially sat over the second engine room that Titanic had, that was the, the central turbine engine room, and this also needed some fresh air. And the main engine room had its own shaft, but the turbine room had a very special apparatus as a way of getting fresh air down into the ship. And that was with the fourth funnel. Because of course, the fourth funnel wasn't connected to any boilers that the Titanic used to, to burn coal, and so it didn't need to extract any smoke. And you can actually see here in this plan, this whole area is the is the casing. So this was kind of empty except for some baffles, some like uh, some plating that separated it into different sections for different purposes. But here there is a staircase. And the reason there's a staircase is the crew could actually climb that staircase all the way up to the top of the fourth funnel and have a smoke or have a breather. And there's a really very famous photograph of Titanic departing on her final voyage. You can actually see somebody's head just at the very top of the fourth funnel. Obviously someone who climbed this staircase. And if you follow this staircase in the plans, it goes all the way down, right down into the turbine room, which is hundreds of feet below. So if you're not like me and terribly afraid of heights, you should be fine climbing that staircase. <laughs> We'll move down to B-Deck now, because this is where Titanic really distinguishes herself against Olympic. On the original 1911 plans that I was talking about from the shipbuilder... <laughs> I gotta sneeze. I gotta do it. Nope. <clears throat> Maybe I'll just leave that in the video. I don't know. On the... <laughs> oh, it's too late. It's too late. On the original 1911 plans of the Olympic and Titanic, you can see that this whole area is a walking promenade. It is blank. There are some staterooms inboard of that, which would have had a nice little view, had some windows looking out on the promenade here. Most of it was for first class, but this little bit at the back was for second. On Titanic, they just deleted it. They realized there was too much walking space for passengers, and so this is where Titanic became larger than Olympic. The fact being that they took this uh, section of open promenade that wasn't included in Olympic's gross registered tonnage, the way that they actually measured the size of the ship. Once they enclosed it and turned it into staterooms, it meant Titanic could count that space as gross registered tonnage. And therefore Titanic, even though it was the same size as Olympic, had a larger gross registered tonnage rating than her older sister ship, therefore being the biggest ship in the world, even though Olympic and Titanic were the same size. What's interesting about these spaces is these were where they installed the most unique, the most luxurious staterooms on the ship. And it all happened about here from the second to the third funnel. This is where you get, and it's marked out on the plans here, you can see all the different styles of cabin. You can see modern style, French style, the Louis XVI style, you can see modern Dutch, old Dutch. Just a lot of different um, different themes. And then on the port side, there's Queen Anne, uh, which is another style. Um, all different periods of interior design and architecture. Now here we can see the docking bridge at the very stern of the ship. They've actually separated this in the plan so you can get more of an idea of, of what's going on. You can actually see there's a telegraph to the bridge. So this is the way that, as I mentioned earlier, they would communicate, hey, cast off lines, make fast, slacken the lines, um, just to prepare the ship to get underway, basically. Just below this, down on sea deck, you have one of my favorite spaces in the ship, and that is the steering engine room, or the steering gear room. And it's so underrepresented and kind of a bit of a mystery to a lot of uh, people who are interested in Titanic. It's the 
It's the room at the very back of the ship, essentially, and what's really interesting about it is it sits directly over the rudder and it's got all the machinery that would have operated the ship's rudder. And that machinery comprises of a set of twin miniature reciprocating steam engines that you would have seen pretty much just like down in the engine room, the main engine room. And this is what would turn this in really bizarre set of gears to essentially operate a, a quadrant to shift the rudder left or right. And then dotted around this space, you have a ton of other steam engines. So auxiliary steam engines operating the ship's capstans. So the capstans sit up, there are two of them aft of the docking bridge up on the, the poop deck, don't laugh. And then another set just forward of the docking bridge. And what capstans are, are essentially a drum that can pivot around a, a central point. So if you're trying to uh, tighten the lines on the ship and bring it closer to the wharf, right? You take the lines, run it through a fair lead. So that was either a hole in the ship's hull if you wanted to do it below decks or if you wanted to do it on deck. There are also a number of, of bits and bollards and things where you could secure the line. Run it up on deck and then slowly wrap it around the capstan and then engage the steam engine of that capstan and it would begin to turn. And as it turned, it would coil that rope around its, around its drum and of course, you're coiling that rope, it's attached to shore, it's going to slowly then bring the ship closer to the shore, and then you can stop the capstan. And the way that they operated it was there was a very simple set of um, pedestal controls up on deck that was essentially just a brake. That if you turned the wheel, it would essentially release a brake, allowing steam into the capstan steam engine down below in the steering engine room. And that would then begin to turn the capstan, and then you'd just wind it off and that would cause it to stop. Probably the most interesting stuff is up here, at the, um, the, the, in the fireman's area. So this is where the, the guys who are down in the black gang who work down in the, the bunkers, you know, and the, the stoke hole, the shoveling coal and keeping Titanic moving ahead and keeping those boilers fed. This is where they lived. And you can see that they had very, very basic digs. You don't need to, uh, to be a architect to decipher this part of the plan. You can see that they had a galley that was very basic. Actually, there's an interesting story about the galley well, I think it's interesting, at the very least. Early on in Titanic's career, she had the same number of portholes on that side of the ship, on the port side, as Olympic. And they must have realized that it just wasn't enough. Because you imagine that that's where they're cooking food and trying to make um, enough meals to keep these guys, I think it was about 170, 180 men fed, working around the clock 24 seven. Um, they would need to make a lot of food, there's a lot of fumes, a lot of gases. They had a extractor and a skylight to try and get that stuff out, but it probably wasn't enough. So they, on Titanic, installed another porthole here to allow more fresh air in. You often see these portholes swung open as they desperately try to get as much fresh air in as they can. And then after Titanic sank, they did the same thing to Olympic. And for decades now, conspiracy theorists have been saying, huh, there's more portholes on this side of the ship. And uh, after Titanic sank, Olympic had them, so they clearly swapped the ships, and it's not true. It was very, very easy to cut a porthole in the side of a ship. It was a day job, literally a day. You had a machine, you just plonk it on the side of the ship, cut a hole in the steel that's perfectly circular, punch in some rivet holes, put a porthole in, smash the rivets home, and your porthole's ready. That's basically it. So you could just get it done in a day. So very interesting little detail that marked Titanic out from Olympic to begin with. Forward of this, you have a really interesting space, the windless gear room. And this is a really good kind of twin space to the room at the very back of the ship that we were looking at, the steering gear room, because this is where they had all the machinery that would operate the insanely powerful windlasses that were designed to pull Titanic's anchors up. And these things weighed a lot. The central anchor weighed about 16 tons. The other anchors were a little less than that, but they were extremely heavy. So you needed some pretty heavy duty gear to do this. So in this room, they had extremely powerful um, windless steam engines that would essentially work in a very similar manner to the um, capstans, but they had to be much bigger, much meaner. And then also you have the same kind of capstan engines that you had at the stern of the ship, or essentially identical. There's something really interesting here. You can see a wire reel. And so this was a uh, giant spool by which they could feed a steel rope or a wire out through the hawse hole, which is at the, the very bow of the ship. It kind of looks like an eye and um, they could feed a cable through that, the wire, and uh, from that reel and then attach the central anchor of Titanic to that, to that reel with the crane that was provided, the little triangular crane at the bow of the ship. And then 
lower the uh, the anchor away and provide a third anchor to secure Titanic in the event that she was moored and there was a storm coming in and she needed to be held fast. She would probably only ever have to do that in her service career, excluding wartime service, in probably uh, Cove, Queenstown, maybe maybe Cherbourg in France, because she was too big to enter the port there. She had to stand to and allow tenders to come out to her. So she'd be in the in the open water and she'd need to hold herself in, in place. But to the best of our knowledge, um, the third central anchor was never actually used. Down on D-Deck, we have forward um, the third class open space. So this was a, um, a kind of general room for the third class, which was probably the largest um, general room that they had on the ship, the, the largest space. And this is where they had the famous party on the, on the final uh, night before Titanic hit the berg. And they were celebrating, you know, reaching a new world, starting a new life, getting to America. Unfortunately, as it would turn out, celebrated a little bit prematurely. And this is where that party happened. And um, in the film, they're dancing on top of uh, these things here. This is the hatch cover, the number two and the number three hatches that you would essentially take all these boards off and be able to lower um, cargo down into the ship. Kind of unlikely that they would have been dancing on top of these um, because they were uh, fenced off. They had like a little railing around them and um, there was a small likelihood you would crash through all the way down into the, <laughs> into the bottom of the ship. So it was ill-advised. You can see they had a little bar, and um, yeah, it would have been a pretty cozy little space. I talk about this space a lot, but I had to do it again. We talked about it in the breakup video, but the, the pantry and the first and second class galleys here. Can we just appreciate <laughs> the size of this kitchen? Like, how insane this is. It runs uh, from the, the number three funnel past the fourth funnel. And uh, it's extremely impressive, what can I say? There's some really interesting um, little rooms in here, including uh, the sculleries, the, the coal bunker. They needed coal to heat the ovens. A lot of these ovens were, were coal-fired, so they had to have their own little, little coal bunker here to be able to feed those. But uh, in an interesting twist, just here uh, on the starboard side of the ship, you can see the infectious hospital and the hospital wards. So, funny place to put it. Usually these were at the stern of the ship towards the, the, the back, but it could have been maybe so they could get fresh food to them quicker. I don't know. It's just an interesting, interesting location. But here is one of the, uh, uh, well, probably two of the most interesting spots on the ship. Uh, one of these is, of course, the infectious hospital. So, disease at sea, bad news, not good. And in fact, uh, Olympic had to be quarantined once and she had to stand to in New York because there was an outbreak of, a, of an illness, which nobody likes. I mean, nobody could get off the ship. Plague at sea could kill an entire ship's complement in the days of sail. Ships would be expected if they landed and there was any sign of sickness or plague, that ship would be in quarantine until the illness had passed or everybody had died. It was pretty gnarly stuff. And so, by Titanic's day, they had a little bit of a better understanding of how this illness worked. So they had an infectious hospital, and this could be um, actually sealed off, and if you were exhibiting signs of a, of a contagious illness, you'd be put in this ward. But here is one of my favourite rooms on the ship, the padded room. Uh, it is exactly as it sounds like. It is a padded cell. In case anybody lost their mind, they would be put in that room. It was, uh, you know, if anyone were prone to hysterics or there any kind of... Um, random outbursts or anybody uh, criticised the chef's cooking, they'd be put in the padded room. That's true, not many people know that. Titanic had a padded cell. So uh, way back at the stern of the ship here, there are um, a couple of my favourite rooms on Titanic. And the reason for this being that this is the point where Titanic's stern began to curve, flare out really dramatically. Titanic had what is called a clipper stern, and this is a, a style of of stern for a ship that had been popular from the, you know, the mid 1800s all the way through to about the 1920s. Titanic was in the kind of last generation of ships that had this style of stern. And so it was like a knife towards the bottom of the ship. The profile was extremely lean and extremely sharp. And then as it got up, got up, got up, it suddenly flared out into this brilliant curve. And it meant that a lot of the cabins around here, like staterooms here, 136 and 137, had floors that were the um, flare of Titanic stern as it came up, then would curve up to create the wall. So it wasn't like a 90 degree angled wall. 
it was just this consistent curve where like the floor just suddenly became the wall and uh maximizing space right they put staterooms in there they put cabins for third class and uh they put bunks kind of like at that awkward bit where the wall becomes the floor i think chris walker from titanic rms titanic designs has rendered a, a stateroom here really bizarre kind of fun if you had to stay in third class anywhere that would be the one it's also conveniently located down on e deck um things become a little monotonous except for one room possibly the most important room on titanic in fact it's not even a room it's a complex possibly more impressive than the galley in the kitchen this is the potato complex and uh i'm not making that up you can see here that there are two spaces dedicated dedicated to potatoes now this wasn't just to satisfy the irish members of um of titanic's passengers and crew potatoes were used in almost every meal potatoes are the best food everybody knows that they are objectively the best food i'm a brady my granddad was from dublin i know that potatoes are the best food and titanic was expected to carry a lot of them so she needed to have a dedicated space so here we have potato storage and a potato wash place with bins for the potatoes where they could be taken up taken down to the galley taken up to the galley where, wherever they needed to go a trough to wash them all peel them that kind of thing how do you peel that many potatoes you're not going to have people standing there all day doing this even as a punishment <laughs> titanic had an electric potato peeler it would be able to peel them en masse it was probably going all day and all night you can see it here marked out in the plans you can see a little electric engine um, which was like standard for the time with a belt running to the machine which would have had a big vat that you put all the potatoes in and they get peeled i can't believe we spent this much time talking about potatoes but there you go okay final sheet of the drawings we are now down to um f deck and again this is a uh, a, a space just jammed full of um third class staterooms and uh, it gets a little bit monotonous around here um but there is a really interesting thing about f deck and this is where the big Scirocco fans were located that were designed to essentially pull fresh air in from from all the way up uh, at the top of the ship deep down into the uh, the boiler rooms to keep it refreshed to try and get some cool air down there but it kind of didn't help because titanic was uh she had very hot boiler furnaces i think it got up to as much as like 40 degrees celsius or, or more down on g deck and we are really getting down into the the bottom of the ship here you can still see that forward there's still a lot of firemen there's still a lot of uh, engineers being being kept here but this is where we start to see some third class and these were some of the third class who started to get their feet wet very early on in the night of the sinking but here we have the engineer's store uh, the engineer's workshop and the paint store again some of these things that all ships need to carry but things you might not immediately think of you know an engineer's workshop to do some really basic simple repairs you know there's they've got a vice on the bench here they've got a lathe they can machine their own parts if they break anything they can actually take some some bare steel and knock something out of it turn it on the lathe they can actually make some stuff which is really cool there's a paint store um titanic would need to be constantly painted to keep that that rust away to keep her looking fresh and this is where they'd keep all that paint and then after this after the uh turbine engine room you have one of the really impressive um spaces on the ship and this is a large um, cold storage room which has some probably surprising spaces you might not have thought of you can see there's fruit eggs milk and butter meat and poultry all the stuff you'd expect vegetables fish whole rooms dedicated to this stuff right mutton look how much space there is for mutton that only shows how popular mutton was back in the day but interestingly there's an ice room and to the right of that you'll see there's an ice cream room ice cream was one of these things that was kind of new and exciting to be able to have at sea i mean this would have just been unthinkable very very recently in the past by 1912 standards so having um an ice cream at sea was like the height of luxury and it was all kept down here in the uh, the, the, the cold storage space down below on the um all up deck we start to see some other really interesting little rooms my third favorite room 
behind the potato room and the padded cell, the champagne room. This is where they'd keep all the champagne. You can see the wine and spirits. We know that um, there was more kept up in the pantries because Titanic, when she um, sank and broke apart, a lot of this stuff was just spilled out. So there's tons of bottles of wine and champagne littering the seafloor. But there would have been a lot kept in this room. And what I would give just to have 10 minutes in that room. Really interestingly, on the starboard side though, you have um, two different rooms for beef. And if you thought mutton was important, you ain't got nothing on beef. Because beef was so important that it would be split into two different sections for the voyage. Because of course Titanic would be going out westbound to New York, coming back eastbound to the United Kingdom. She needs to carry enough beef for the entire voyage. So you have a dedicated westbound beef room for the voyage there. And it's, you can see it's larger than the eastbound beef room because typically there'd be fewer passengers coming back to the United Kingdom. You'd have all the, uh, the immigrants mostly sailing out to America and fewer coming back. Down here, we have the boiler rooms. And uh, the boiler rooms we've covered in some pretty decent detail, as well as the engine rooms and the turbine engine room. So I'm not going to go into those, but I will talk briefly about these little things here. You can see there's a little marker here for ash ejectors. And um, typically Titanic's boilers were, you know, burning tons of coal. I think it was like 600 to 800 tons of coal per day. And that created a lot of ash. So what do you do with it all? You can't store it on board. You can't burn it. You can't really get rid of it any easy way or store it. So the best thing to do was to take it out and mix it with water and essentially get it over the side of the ship in a kind of sludge. And the way that they would do this is they would have these um, ash ejector units that would be operating on a constant loop, providing water at extremely high pressure that the ash could be shoveled into. And it would take the, uh, the sludge that it created from down here in the bottom of the ship up one or two decks to above the waterline and then spew it through scuppers, which are the little engineering holes all the way down the side of the ship, spew it out into the water directly. And it would do that constantly. So in old photographs of ships like this, you can constantly see water streaming out of the sides of these little scuppers. That could be engineering water. It could be toilet water. Yes, they didn't have sewage tanks. They literally just over the side of the ship. Makes the Titanic seem a little less romantic. And they would constantly be having this, this sludge, this slurry of water be, be being discharged over the side of the ship. Well, there you have it. We've looked at Titanic from the boat deck down to the tank top. We've picked out some interesting things. I'd really like to congratulate everyone who worked on this. It's uh, pretty impressive. There's a, um, well, they say it takes a village to raise a baby. And uh, there is a pretty impressive list of names here. There are some, some big Titanic heavy hitters in here. So I just wanted to say congratulations to everybody who contributed to this remarkable set of plans. And I could not recommend you getting your hands on them more. Go and visit the link that I left below. Well done to Matt DeWinkler, who worked extremely hard on these plans and getting them as accurately as possible. Of course, because Titanic's plans, the originals, have been, for the most part, long lost, aside from a, a few useful ones here and there, we'll never know for certain what the ship was like on the inside, but we can base a lot of assumptions off of her sister ship Olympic, that we have a really good idea of what her inside layout was like, as well as other ships from the era, because like I said, if you can understand Titanic, you can understand other ships just like her. You know that there was probably a potato room on other ships of Titanic's era, not just Titanic. I think every ship should have a potato room. Every house should have a potato room. Maybe, maybe this can be my, maybe this can be my potato room. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this look at Titanic's plans. As always, stay safe and stay happy. And I'll see you again next time. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy. And I'll see you again next time.